Circuit here in New Orleans. Access uh -oh. Week. Welcome to Artist Review. It's the end of February, the last Wednesday of February 2011. We're only a days away from the beginning of our Mardi Gras season, even though really it started last Saturday with our famous crew de vue. But the official uh, week starts two days from now, so hallelujah. We're all excited. We've had great, lovely, warm temperature. Uh, it's going to cool down a little bit next week, but important thing is we've gotten rid, rid of old winter cold, we hope for sure. Some of the other folks in our country are still suffering, so that's, that's why it pays to come and live here in the South and specifically down here in New Orleans. And as you know, we this is our time to bring artists to you once a month, uh, and we're real pleased today to have a lovely young lady, and she's uh, just graduated from school, and she's been pursuing her career during school, and she's uh, interested in uh, making a go of it and moving forward with it. So uh, I want you to help us welcome Teresa Woods. Teresa, welcome to the Hi. show. Great, great. Tell us why. Now, the important thing is I know we always love on all of our shows to bring natives to the uh, to the screen so that uh, they can uh, they just have more passion and pride about our city and I understand we're pleased to hear that you are a native is that right yes Excellent. born and raised born and raised tell us a little bit about yourself and um, don't hesitate and then let us know um, what first got you interested in art and even if it's not as a painter or whatever it's strictly as a um, you know, interested art person. What 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 intrigued you about that? Well, I've always been interested in art. I've, when I was younger, I doodled. I you know just drew, tried to read you know, whatever I saw. I tried to draw, but it wasn't until the seventh grade that I really realized that I was actually good at it. Because um, I was doing an English as assignment, we had to draw a scene from a book that we were reading, and my teacher, I remember her name, Miss Oliver, she looked over my shoulder, she was like, Teresa, that is so wonderful, are you in TAV? That's uh, the Talented and Visual Program, mm -hmm. and I was like, no, and I was kind of like shocked, because I was like, you're a little surprised, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I don't, but she I don't recognized like your it. talent, yeah, she did, and I okay. really think of that, because ever since, I've always had something to do with art, whether it was in the forefront, or, you know, just something I did on the side, it's always been a part of my life. Now, by any chance, is anyone else in your family as uh, interested in art as you are, are or have um, been? Not as interested, but I do have family members that kind of started, but they kind of, you know, moved so, to a different And path. do you think they that kind of impressed you, too, before that seventh grade recognition? or did Yeah, you, uh, definitely. Um, I had an older cousin, because I didn't have any older brothers. His uh -huh. name was um, Emmanuel, and he did a lot of um, airbrushing. He did oh, really okay. sketched because, you know, airbrushing was really sure. popular back then. Sure. And that really impressed me a lot. And so when I found out that I had that talent also, it really, you know, made me want to do it more because I wanted to be like him. So. But as you said, you first started just by doodling, is yeah. that right? Yeah. I was and always trying to draw something. Something, huh? But that, that's it. That's the passion trying to come out and express itself. So. We're pleased that Ms. I think you said Ms. Oliver yeah. recognized and started you on the right path to uh, help hopefully make a successful career out of it. Um, now, right now, the uh, Teresa doesn't have a website. We're hoping we're talking about her about how valuable that is today in an artist's life. And I know she's going to look toward doing something. And she doesn't have a gallery, so any of you gallery owners out there that would like to show some of her work, please uh, contact us through the website and uh, email, we'll be happy to refer you to her. The uh, thing about it is that she is a multimedia artist. We very rarely see someone dabbling in more than one of their specialties. Sometimes they will and do one, but she's really uh, into several. Uh, she's got some sculpture and in various different types of, of paintings. And <laughs> oh, excuse me. That's what happens on a live show. I'm sorry about that. Pardon me. Uh, but, you know, the majority of the things, she's also dabbles in photography. And as you know, we have, uh, that seems to be the least interested artist to come on this particular show. We get one per year. So uh, this will be our first for this year, even though she's not only a photographer, she's an artist and also a sculptor. So she's doing dabbling in three, and I think you'll see she's doing a darn good job on each. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look. And what I'm going to do is reach for her first painting. Uh, now none of her stuff is framed because she 
lets the uh, obviously the uh, purchaser or the thing go ahead and visualize how they want to see it. This is uh, a lovely small, and I'm just going to say it's a landscape. I'm probably wrong, and I want to ma- think it's maybe watercolor. But why don't you, Teresa, tell us uh, exactly what we have here? It is a watercolor. It's um, it's right. of the sky. It's of not, the sky, it not land. land okay. in it. Because I mean, in New Orleans, you always see like you know beautiful colors in the sky. And ever since I was young, this is one of, my, of earlier ones. Okay. Um, I've always been interested in like clouds and the different shapes they form. And so this is one I did in watercolor. Mm-hmm. And um, it's about. It's about 20 by, maybe 20 by 12 or something. Yeah, and what is it on paper, huh? Yeah, it's on paper. On paper. Now, what time of the day do you think this was? Because it's such a magnificent, it looks, in one screen it looks bright, vibrant yellow like it would be midday, but the other almost has an orange tint. That's what shows you how different monitors can pick up color. And a beautiful rush and blues, which would kind of lean toward maybe the afternoon or near sunset. What what do you recall when you did it? I know it was a long time ago. I think it was more afternoon. It was definitely more afternoon. In the mid afternoon. Yeah. Okay. So this is again, as she mentioned, is what we're doing is going to see an evolution, not only in different styles, different media, uh, but different techniques. So here was an early water culture on the sky, and just beautifully done. Okay. Now, Teresa, why don't we pick up one over there, and let's take a look, and why don't you let us know about this one? Um, this one is also watercolor. It's done around the same time as the last one. It's um, Really, I, at this point, I was just, I had my paint out and I wanted to paint something. So I just kind of went with my emotions and what I was feeling at the time. And I just kind of went with it and came out, I think, nice. Um, I like a lot, I always, whenever I do paintings, I always use a lot of color. I love color. Right. Well, I, I, like I say, this compared to the first one, the first one was really subtle in its color. But this is very vibrant, magnificent, bright tone. And this is really an abstract. So we've already gone from something that uh, is totally discernible, the sky, even though I call, I call it land, yeah. to something of an abstract nature and just beautifully done. And, and uh, anything that you can tell us that impressed you on this other than just one just wanted to get a lot of color on on the can. Um, I think what impressed me about it when I was this is when I was first starting off. Um, I just went with whatever I was feeling. I didn't have any set plan. I just had my paint out, my brush, and I just started, you know, flinging around the paint and doing things. And as I went on, I really got into it and added more things as I saw until I felt it was done. And so that's what I... Oh, really neat. Now, again, what, this is on paper. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And uh, this is more of a vertical rather than horizontal, so depending on what your wall would be. What uh, what uh, dimensions do you think this might be for the, for the audience? This so. one, I think maybe... Maybe 18 by 12. Okay, 12 by 18, yes. Okay. And again, folks, just take a look. I'm hoping the uh, camera does justice because you've really got some vibrant colors. Now, if you're muted tones, then, of course, you're probably interested in the first one or this last one. But if you're looking for some vibrant, without being bold, it's interesting because these are subtle. Even though they're bright colors, they're very subtly presented. So it's not stark and really bright that it, it's glaring almost like a gloss it's very uh, matte finish and uh, just beautiful be- beautifully done yeah that comes with when using watercolor i think ah really okay maybe so all right now let's go back up to the sky i have another one and then we're going to move on to other things and uh, this is uh, and I, I got this one right i believe this is the sky yeah. and clouds and just yeah. What a beautiful representation. Again, now, is this uh, this is more vibrant than the watercolor, yeah, so what are we doing this here? This is acrylic. Oh, acrylic. acrylic. Of course, everybody knows that's the uh, the new uh, important thing in the last 20 years, 25 years, uh, is because of the magnificent brightness and the colors come, almost giving it the oil look, but at the same time with being such a range of magnificent bright colors. And again, once again, the sky, and this would certainly be on a beautiful day, not probably in the early part yeah. or midday, huh? Yeah. And uh, anything particular? Did cloud formations impress you, or are you just uh, looking up and wanted to do a beautiful representation? I find myself always looking at the clouds or right. trying to pull my phone out to take a picture so I maybe paint it later. So whenever I do clouds, I, I really enjoy that. So you're saying that some of your, some of your subjects, as we'll see, uh, the, of your paintings are actually coming from the photo, a photograph of something you did. Was, was this uh, based no, on that or just that on direct I, observation? I, use, I take pictures to 
kind of you know get the impression of feel of how clouds are in certain parts of the day uh -huh. that really that okay. one's so most of so of. most of your work does include photography yeah. first yeah. of which you work on ah okay i didn't know that so that's something we learned uh, and that uh will show why uh you do so well in some of the photographs as we go further. Now, this is probably the smallest piece. I would think this is more like almost um, eight and a half by twelve, or yeah. something like that. Yeah, almost like a letter size, a little larger than other size, and done on once again the horizontals. But look how great! What a perfect thing for a nice blank wall or even a, ch a child's room. So heavenly, it'd be just really lovely, really great colors. Okay, now let's take. Would you mind now? We're going to move into some photographs. Mm -hmm. All right, why don't we go ahead and take one and let's take a look. These are some photographs of my two nieces. Um, this one is Angel, and that's Kayla. Let's see if we can uh, get a close-up of that, because uh, from here it's looking like nothing. We really got to get close. Can we get close to that, uh, Mr. Cameraman? I'm hoping we can, huh? Ah, great. There we go. All these, that's what we need to do all the rest of these photographs. Okay, so these are your two little nieces, mm -hmm. right? And... Um, I right. thought it was interesting the curiosity that little kids have at the simplest things and I just when I was taking this picture I, they were looking at um, my sister's little camera and they were like so focused in on it and I wanted to get their expression. You certainly did count. I was wondering. I'm glad you I would have never <laughs> and, and if you asked me what do you think they're looking at I would have never thought a camera. <laughs> I mean because I wouldn't think a child would be that you know, intent on something like that, unless it had a lot of gadgets. You know, no, I mean, it unless was very it was simple, but it was really bright pink. I think that's what kind of. Well, oh, me the it. color is really. <laughs> but I mean, you really did capture the focus of the two young ladies because both of them, their eyes are just glued yeah. to the source object. Uh, and uh, so, why don't you give us an idea? What size is this photograph again? This, this is, is probably maybe letterhead size again. Yeah, I mean, this is taken with a thirty-five millimeter camera. Okay, and it's probably uh, eight by four. Maybe. Okay. Like that. No, I think it's more than that. It's almost, uh, maybe maybe. That. It's almost uh, eight and a half by 11, but a little smaller than that, huh? Yeah. Now tell us, how did you, um, when did you get in, interested in photography? I know we learned that before you do paintings, you usually take photographs of your subjects so you'll have them fresh uh, yeah. when you actually, but when did you actually start getting interested in photography itself um, as a general? Well, when I was in high school, I was interested in it, but I didn't have the means to do it really, so mm -hmm. I kind of try to take pictures with my mom or my dad's camera or something. So when I got to Xavier, that's where I graduated from, they had a ph black and white photography class and they were offering, you know, to, to use their cameras. Ah, so you had so, a lot more variety of uh, equipment to yeah. use. Ah. And I found that I really do enjoy it. Now, did they have to teach you how to do all these cameras or did oh, you yeah. just pick them up yourself? No, they, they oh, well, some people, you know, Some <laughs> people can do it. I can't. I, and that's why I give up on I really have to have instruction on all the different gizmos. But, uh, and I know today we're, we're lazy. I mean, I'm not good at 35 millimeters. I just buy the, the typical ones yeah. and let it do all. And you never really get a photograph as, as intrinsic as this. I really like black and white. And I think all of the photographs you've done today are black and white. Do you also do color photographs or you specialize uh, in the black and white? I, I really just like the black and white. I haven't really dabbled in the, the digital. In the, yeah. uh, well, I think, uh, especially since a lot of your work is geared in the photography in, in portraits or individuals, I think it's much more dramatic than putting, color. I mean, color is much more lifelike, but I think the real drama, and I, I remember when, when we first went to color cameras, and so I was really disappointed because I just thought it lost a lot of its uh, significance, mm -hmm. that even though it was closer to reality, at the same time, as I mentioned, I use the word drama a lot, the dramatic output of uh, a black and white photograph is just to me far superior than any any color photograph and, it, and it's interesting to see because so many people will do both today both in black and white the same subject and then also in color side by side and usually I'll always pick the uh, to me the black and white just as far above the uh, color yeah. okay and that's your nieces what were their names again Angel was, and Kayla oh well, maybe they're outside watching of course <laughs> they're probably gonna I want, I want some kind of recognition for this. <laughs> okay, now we have another young lady on I'm holding, and uh, 
Is this another cousin? Let's see if we can. That's, uh, um, that's Angela. It's one of the girls. That oh, one of the same. Picture. Well, she looks so different, huh? <laughs> well, one is because she's you know right on the camera, yeah. you know, looking at you instead of something else. And it, it's kind of her personality too, because she likes to really be in your face. She likes attention. Oh, she so does. I like to try to pull that character out in the pictures. So. Oh well, you can tell it from the smile. Like <laughs> I said before, she was so focused on the other thing, and even though it was great. This is truly a great portrait because this is someone who definitely likes to be in front of the camera yeah. <laughs> and knows that she's photogenic. How old about is she? In that picture, I think she was two. Two? Maybe. Okay, and how old is she today? Um, maybe three. Oh, so she's not much older, so this is yeah. pretty recent. Yeah. Okay, and once again, you've really done just great work with regard to the eyes and the smile. I mean... Putting those two together, just an unbeatable combination. And what would you say, is, again, the size is small. What are we thinking? It's the same as the other one. Same as the other one? one? Okay. So, same. What's her name again? Angel. Angel. Very pretty. Beautiful young lady. Okay, now I think you. Have, I think we have one or two more photographs. Yeah, three more. <laughs> Let's see what we got this here. This is one of Kayla's by herself. She's a little more feisty, so... When wow. she was doing that, I, I really liked that one because it really shows her personality. I was taking a picture, and she was like, what are you doing? <laughs> so. <laughs> and you can almost see her mouthing those words, huh? <laughs> it's like, who asked you to invade my world, yeah. huh? And what was she doing at the time? What is the uh, um, thing in front of her? I can't make out what that that's is. That's uh, railing on the step. She oh, just, 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 oh, just hold on. She had on. looked over and saw me, and she's like, what are you doing? Oh, so, wow. Wow. Now, um, how old is she when she did she's it? She's uh, three, but she's four now, so four. she's a year so older. Still young. And her name is what? Kayla. Kayla. So great. I mean, you really recognize the talent, folks, don't you, with regard to the ability to extract from the faces. So I think your portraits and photography are just really remarkable because, uh, once again, everything around just blends in. I mean, other than the thing that's in the railing, which I had to ask for, I really paid no attention to the background at all. It kind of fades in. Even though it's not blurry, it just fades. It literally fades into the background. It really has a 3D effect where she's almost superimposed over the yeah. picture. That's what it looks. So you've really got a great technique and a great quality. Anything else you want to say about this? It's a really nice one. That's it. Okay. All right. Well, now we're moving. We've got, like I said, one or two more. And we're moving away from the photo, from the portrait, and this is a uh, cool. And uh, tell us what this one's about. This one is of the sh of a, the streetcar, um, and it's with a 35 millimeter camera, but it's a slow shutter speed, so it it um, captures the motion. Uh huh. And it kind of, if you look at the background, the trees the trees aren't really defined. Every nothing right. is really defined in the picture. It's just showing how much motion was going on in that one second that I was taking that picture. That well, streetcar was passing. Sure. Now, it's amazing what you've done here again because uh, you've been able to single out. Now, there, the building in the background is quite detailed, but at the same time, like you say, the, the tree has uh, got the fuzziness to yeah. it. So that's interesting. It kind of looks like pin. Yes, very much so. It looks like you did something in charcoal or something like yeah. that, as opposed to the realism is kind of lost on the tree, which yeah. is really interesting. And then, of course, an interesting use of uh, of the black and white the shadows. Most people would say, "Oh my goodness, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take this. If I wanted to see a streetcar, I want to get it in beautiful sunlight." You know, it's just the opposite here. The echoes of the you know the framework of the streetcar in the midst of the shadow it's just amazing how it uh, once again gives it a kind of a ghostly kind of an ethereal quality so so really the front from this through the trees it got more or less realism uh, and only the building in the back has your realistic yeah. view so it, it really is a, almost like a combination of a painting and, and a photograph together so you've really done remarkable on this and I, uh, presumably this was on maybe St. Charles somewhere huh? Can yeah. we, this looks like our old time streetcars and uh, they're very collectible everyone loves to collect the streetcars <laughs> and what I like about this is because it's not just the streetcar being the focus it is focused but it's also not focused so uh, it's a great rendition of putting something in its normal place not saying it's the the feature thing that we have to have presented where most of the other things where all you see is the uh, streetcar in the background is totally oblivious if at all here just the opposite I can say the background to repeat myself is really so significantly uh, real 
and it's only the front that really is more uh, uh, less less real than than the back. So there you go, folks. So here's one for. So it shows she's just not a, uh, a portrait photographer. She's uh, also can handle her own among uh, landscapes and other items by putting other dimensions that uh, actually bring out the subject matter. Folks, as you see on the, on the phone uh, on the screen, our directors put up our two phone numbers, standard numbers every week. And we'd be happy to hear from you. I know Teresa would because uh, that way she could explain something more on any of these pieces that she we're bringing to you today or answer any other questions. So, um, because again, not having her online or having a gallery, uh, you're, you're privileged that this is the only place you're going to see her until hopefully sometime in the new future we can get her okay. her work uh, have work exhibited somewhere, whether it's on the internet and or in the physical, and that way you can come out and meet her and see more detail. Now, are most of these uh, still work that you've had at Yaz, or some of these are actually placed at other places? Wait, what? In other words, is most of this work still in your own collection, or yeah, you've already? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. great, great. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I think you got one more photograph, and again, the last, one. the last one, and again, we've taken what a different look of the same subject banner. We've taken a streetcar, and well, tell us what what it. Because I'll tell you my impression, and of course, I'm usually always contrary to what the artist says. Well, this so. is kind of opposite of the other one. This is kind of more the typical where you would see the streetcar taking a picture. Of. But I I was interested in the little mini toy um, streetcar that they had, so I wanted to kind of focus in on the mini streetcar and still have the you know the normal size streetcars in the background and you. And if you kind of zoom in, you can see like there's still clouds in the top. I always try to get clouds in the in the. Pictures. Fascinated with the clouds, yeah. huh? <laughs> well, I think this one is really over the top because, uh, as I mentioned, first of all, you've got, and this is probably at the end of the line or the beginning of the line, depending on your f perspective, which would be at uh, Claiborne and and uh, Carrollton, huh? But uh, as she mentioned, the uh, the centerpiece of the picture. Uh, is uh, a mini streetcar which was done by I think uh, we had a kind we have these contests uh, periodically by I guess the Young Leadership Council. One was uh, years ago Fish the Fins, and then uh, this was probably the most recent one, whereby um, these um, objects like the streetcar were molded and presented in white, and then different artists would take and make a creation of the, of that, whether it's realistic or fantasyful, and then they were auctioned off and placed at different places, either in private collections or on visible spots usually, so that uh, you can see it. I understand before we go finish on this, we've got a caller, so let's go ahead and take the caller. Uh, welcome to Artist Review. Caller, tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hi, my name is uh, Kimmerer Woods. Okay. And what can and we... I'm calling from New Orleans. Okay, even better. What part of the city are in New Orleans? I was born and raised in Uptown, uh, New Orleans. Okay, so you're calling from Uptown. All right, what would you like to either ask Teresa, myself, or any comments you'd like to make would be appreciated. Um, in reference to the clouds, I know you have a lot of pictures of clouds. How long did it take you to master clouds? Oh, good. Uh, that's a very good question, Amber. Very good. I would have to say I still don't believe I mastered oh. it because the the way it is in my head, I still haven't been haven't quite been able to get it on the paper the way I visual it in my head. So I mean, even though I think they still look nice, they don't. They're not exactly master because clouds are kind of are kind of complex to me, I think. So. <laughs> it's interesting because, spoken like a true artist, uh, a true artist is always a perfectionist, and they never, no work is ever done. If you leave, the longer you leave a piece with an artist in his or her studio, the more he or she's going to do or the more he's going to take away from it because they never are satisfied. They Like a good way, it's pleased, pleasant, nice, attractive, but it's never in their mind perfect to what they visualize. And you and I, the visual uh, artists, we're 
you know, we're more than content with the output that Teresa has put on clouds. I mean, how much better study could you do of the clouds? That's what we say. But uh, I think it's interesting her response, which is just runs very typical of an artist that no work is ever complete. And that's why so many of them hang on to things so long because they always feel they can do something to it to improve on it one way or the other. Amber, that's a great question. Anything else we could answer for you? No, that's it. Listen, we really appreciate you calling in. Uh, and I know Teresa does. It helps amplify. I know that some people out there watching and also gives her a, a better feel of some of the stuff. So her, her, obviously her fascination with clouds is intriguing you and hopefully many others out there. Okay, thanks again. Now let's go back to the photograph. Uh, I know we had that disruption, so we want to go back and reiterate this a little bit more. This is a study of really three streetcars, two actual would do the framing, and each of those are not necessarily divided in half, but just from the logistics uh, uh, scope of the photograph, they're almost halved. Uh, and so you're seeing the mirror, almost like a mirror image of one over the other, even though they're two, because this is where they stop. And the intricate placement of the um, artist uh, model of a streetcar uh, really just adds a whole new dimension. I, I, once again, with my bad eyes, I, I didn't even realize I hadn't been down there to, uh, focused on it that this was actually a, uh, a replica of the, of the streetcar. I thought it was more like a, an old time phone booth. Uh, it gave me a lot of visualizations. In the old days, in fact, the thing still there or before Katrina, there would usually be a little a uh, stand or something at the beginning and it'd be stairs that went to a subterranean. We always would see the uh, streetcar conductors come out of there or go down there. It was always, I remember when we were kids, it was a big secret. Where are they? Were there tunnels under the city? What, what's going on here? Where did they disappear to or where are they coming from? I don't know if it was a place they had a lounge room or what, but or prevented them. Maybe it was a tunnel to go out somewhere, but uh, it's interesting. So I don't know if those still exist since Katrina and all its floods, but that's what I was thinking. This was just a, a marker for the uh, streetcar conductor to head down to whatever that little conclave is below the street. Anyway, uh, it's an interesting perspective and uh, I think really well done with regard to bringing the three streetcars together and using the original ones uh, actually as a frame for the model one. All right, now we're going to go ahead and go something and we're going to spend a little time on this particular one because I think it's the only one that we have. Again, it's a portrait, but what's so interesting it's deceiving because the one is much larger, and uh, I can go ahead and say, if you can't tell already that this is a self-portrait of the artist, I think you can after seeing Teresa's lovely face. Uh, but what's more important is the technique. Uh, I know um, she had told me something about the technique without me pinpointing this, and uh, how and what a perfect word to use, but without me pinpointing, I was thinking this was done with charcoal or pencil, just a beautiful portrait of herself. Uh, but that's not it, folks. So uh, what is the actual technique? Do you have a name for it? And tell us all about it, because that alone adds so much to meaning to this particular photograph, I mean, this particular piece. The technique I use is called stippling. It's actually... Um, stippling. Stippling, yeah. Okay. Yeah, now, stippling, what I know in paint, is sort of like um, um, dabbing things with a sponge or something like that, but I'm sure that's not it here. It's similar, but it's called impressionism that you're thinking about. Okay. Um, but stippling is basically you take a, you use different grades of pen, like a fine pen or a medium and a, or a large, and you use dots. The whole picture is done with nothing but dots. So, so folks, what does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like computerization? Doesn't that sound like pixelization? Because we know now when we it's break down like when we break down the pictures, but it might be squares more than pinpoints. But um, any image is almost broken down. So, what a phenomenal thing! So, these are actually just the points of different different uh, thicknesses or whatever whatever they measure pens in. Is that right? Yeah, and to get the different rendering of uh, the different values in the picture, you either put them really close together you um, if you want a darker one you use the you know the thicker mm -hmm. pen. if you want lighter you use uh, the finer pen and you kind of separate the dots more and so so like yeah so like the let's look at the hairline so in the hair 
you're saying that one you use a thicker pen and they're closer together is that what you're saying or do you actually connect do you actually draw between the things or no no you are use nothing but dots so, so this is absolutely 100 percent dots yes be interesting to has some computer geek calculate the uh, number is. of dots and the, we give them dimensions. It would be interesting to see, huh? It would be a fascinating study. And and how did you come upon this concept, or even want to dabble in it, losing a um, loose term? I, that from my drawing class, Xavier. A lot of the different types of art that I got introduced to was from schooling. Um, okay. So when I did this, I really. Because I the the way the type of artist I am, I'm really focused on detail, small detail. So for for me, this was really fun. Um, and actually, a lot of the parts that I probably could have used a, dark, a thicker pen, I'd still use the fine pen because I wanted to get you know the smallest detail to make it look really similar to the picture that I had. Now I have to ask. This has got to be so intricate. This has got to take a a tremendous amount of time. It does, it does. It does. So you're being honest. So many people, so many artists, oh no, I did that in two weeks. <laughs> this is phenomenal. So so what would you think, length of time, do you have any recollection how long um, it took you to do this? Well, if I was just working on that, it probably yes. would have took me maybe three weeks. But because I was doing other things, I right. had other classes. So you, but still, even if you found, if you were just stand straightforward, you could do something of this magnitude in, in three weeks. Yeah. Wow, that is phenomenal. And how did you decide to do a self portrait? Now, once again, did you take a photograph of yourself? Yeah, it was a, hold a mirror up to yourself? Or what did uh, you do? I couldn't <laughs> hold a mirror up. I, <laughs> I knew that would be difficult to hold a mirror and also use the pins. Well, the uh, teacher, she took a picture and she liked the background because she was like, I think you can do it. So she kind kind of got me in an area where there's a lot of things in the background and kind of made the picture more dynamic. So she took the picture and you grid it off and you take square by square and you really try to focus on the smallest detail to get, once you get the big picture, it really looks So are those tiles good. behind you? What yeah, that's, there's, there's tiles on the wall. Yeah, fantastic. Now I have to ask, what is, at first I thought in your hair was your, your glasses. That's a headband. Ah, uh, okay. Now I said, but wait, she's got glasses on her face. So, uh, <laughs> is she a uh, double the net person? Or no. one's a uh, far away vision, one's close vision, something I would need? This is really well done. And about how long ago was this of you? Because it's um, you know, just so maybe, contemporary. Hmm? Maybe a year. A year? Fantastic. Now tell us, have you done, have you, I mean, was this a one time only? I had want to give it a try and be successful, or did you move on and do any others like this? I did, I started another one, but okay. I didn't finish it. Didn't finish. Was it also a portrait? Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, I just think it's something that ought to be pursued because, folks, this is phenomenal. I mean, uh, uh, again, uh, unless I'm mistaken, I haven't seen anything like this other than done in charcoal or, like I said, or in pencil. So, to think um, you could go to that length and create something so realistic, that's what's so good and so dynamic. I mean, for a portrait, I could see you maybe doing an abstract or doing maybe even just a landscape or a, a figurescape, but to actually go and do a portrait, it's just absolutely phenomenal because it's, it's just so detailed and so accurate and realistic that... Uh, and I brought... There's one other thing. We had an artist on several years ago, Thomas Berger, who acts, and several others have, are now doing this, are uh, painting on screens, like, in fact, it's part of the, you know, we a lot of our artists have become, uh, come from post-Katrina recovery, where they're taking salvaged materials and doing, you know, making uh, 3D pieces, uh, I forgot what you call multimedia pieces, but one he actually painted on screen and, and made them so realistic, and I told him when he was on our thing that uh, what was very interesting is that the very first piece of art that I bought for my mom when I was 16 years old at an auction, when we came over, it was just an old master of uh, a lady, uh, well, of course, those were Rubenesque women with cupids around, out uh, bathing or something by the uh, by a stream. It was done, I thought, for years in charcoal or black or pencil. It was an oval thing. And when the frame deteriorated, I wanted to replace it for her, we found out that this was actually done on a lady's, uh, and I would say French, nylon. Just something that it would wear. And it was just so amazing to, because when you look at it just like this, 
you would swear it was uh, a painted piece or like I said, an etched piece, but certainly not on all these little squares. So a similar kind of idea, but those were like uh, a nylon paint, pixelization. So it shows you, and you're really talented and have the patience, what you can do, because these are extreme, tedious type measures that uh, I think, uh, you know, other than the, the tedium of it, I think should bear great results, because it's just a beautiful thing you've done here. Okay, I, mean, I think we've done enough here in regard to that. We're, let's go back and rehash a little bit before we finish. We have uh, Teresa Woods in the studio. She is a native. Uh, as you can see, uh, she's a graduate of Xavier, we said, where uh, she took her our God-given interest in art or doodling and, and, and specifically portraiture and found out all about the different techniques that were available to an artist to bring to the world you know what they saw through their eyes and as you can see she's not only experimenting uh, in almost all of these she's excelled in experimentation and she's mastered that so and so she's really moved in different directions uh, and which is very unusual for some of the uh, artists today strictly would only do one item and that's it but shows a talent if an artist can express themselves in more than one media well done and of course that's a true talent and needs to be uh, exposed and also uh, shown to the world. All right, now we've moved out of her, her um, some of our early watercolors. We've seen some of her great portrait and also um, still life photographs of all different dimensions. And we've just seen a magnificent, unique portraiture done by, um, what was it again? Spa spackling? No. Stippling. Sp stippling. Stippling. Yeah. Okay. Use different pen points. Now we're going to go into some more and we're going to go to our our film uh, crew is going to move up to the front of the studio because these are much larger pieces and it's much easier handled uh, up there instead of by us in, in the back studio. And we're going to see some paintings and actually a magnificent sculpture that uh, is very contemporary, very intriguing, and again, very, very unique. But let's go ahead, Teresa, and take a look. Don't forget the numbers up. We'd love to hear from anybody because uh, it's always a treat for these artists to get some feedback about their work or questions about their work just like I asked them, but it's always good to hear from you out there, so don't hesitate to give us a call. But meanwhile, let's go ahead and take a look at the first one in the in the studio, and this is a, a more traditional piece of art, a painting. Let's talk about this. This is a still life. Um, it, it was on the table and had a yellow sheet behind, uh, hanging behind it, and again, like I, I really try to get realistic when I do my different types of art so mm -hmm. um, now what are we using here what media this is on canvas it's acrylic also acrylic and uh, what size and this is a little harder I know you're far from it what size do you think this is I think is? it was about three by two three by two by three or three, three, almost by maybe three, three and three. a half oh, yeah. yeah and it's a great uh, run again wonderful use of color and it's interesting here because she's got those bright vivid colors of the abstract but here it certainly bright and vivid, not that muted look of the colors. And then she's also mixing with them the kind of toned down neutral colors of the uh, what well, looks like a clay pot because the color is represented, it doesn't matter, but I'm just the color colorations there and also of the flower are much more muted and subdued than the vibrant colors of surroundings. And here you can see how well they play together. It's really interesting, the contrast of the the brightness of the majority of the uh, situation, the glass, the empty glass, and what are some of the other things on the on the plate? There's um, an orange, the green one's a lime, and there's three lemons on the Okay. Table. Okay, so great, great fruit and uh, uh, wine glass, and of course a lovely pot with some flowers. And we said it's a larger piece on canvas, not framed, it's not gallery wrapped. Do you know what gallery wrapping is? Gallery wrapping is kind of the latest thing because people, uh, especially as our art is getting larger and larger, uh, people do not want to go to the expense, and they feel that the art should represent itself, of framing. So instead of framing, the artist will continue the painting 
around the sides because the canvas does wrap around to be fastened to the uh, wood frame. Yeah. So what they would do is extend like, and you know, in this particular one, it would be relatively easy to gallery wrap. So maybe you could, if it doesn't belong to something, maybe you could even go back and, and, and add to it because it really makes it even much more contemporary. And that's by taking that just the yellow background and for the most part, three quarters of your painting and that's all it would require. But maybe at the top, as you see, we're scanning up to the top now. There, you can actually continue not only the yellow, but maybe finish off the the wow. hibiscus or that lily. Yeah. And uh, again, not telling you what to do, but I'm just mm -hmm. saying I know this is a very contemporary trend that for people who, uh, especially uh, people who are on a budget or whatever, uh, and just like that contemporary look of the art piece without either a choice of a frame by a studio or an artist or their own. They just like the look of that mounted on the wall by itself. So interesting interesting dynamic here between the muted colors and the bright colors. Okay, let's take a look at the next piece, please. Let's see what we got. Okay, hopefully we're moving. Okay, okay, we're going to draw back. <coughs> Teresa, tell us a little bit about what this piece is. This one is also a still life. Um, okay. It's a little more busier. Um, there's cloth. There's different um, pots. Or and yeah, let's take a little time on this now because I'm, I'm missing. Uh, you know, I'm deaf from one ear, so you've got a lovely petite voice. <laughs> but uh, this, first of all, let's, is this black and white? This is on this is, paper. What is this? This is on paper, but it's done with uh, different degrees of uh, pencil, graphite. Okay, so using graphite on this. Yeah. And we've got a still life again. And tell us, what, tell us what's on on the still life. A table with what? Um, it's a, it's on a table. It's covered with cloth, and then there's um, different eggs placed different in different areas. There's um, little teapots and different things. And there's actually a trash can on the side, and we were just grabbing stuff, putting it on there. And there's um, some paper wrapped around there to uh -huh. kind of give it that dynamic feel. Giving yeah, movement. some depth to it. Uh -huh. But you're telling me that's a trash can behind the back? Yeah. <laughs> well, you've done amazing job because I would have never, <laughs> never guessed. So you see, folks, you can even bring beauty to something as uh, usually ugly as a trash can. <laughs> and what, would, um, what what interested you in this, and especially doing it in, in graphite instead of either paint, oil, paint, paints or oils or whatever you had done before? Well, it's a black and wanted to do black and white. And um, I, I like drawing also, so this is a part of a drawing class. And so I try to be as detailed as possible for this one also. And just try to get the how the light was bouncing off because the the uh, metal there are metal pieces in there. I was trying to get how the light kind of reflected off each you know piece and how it made different shapes and mm -hmm. the shadows. And shadows, the right? And to do that with pencil was really fun for me. What I also like about this one is. Uh, it's kind of Art Deco, especially at this point, it will slow down a little bit and focus right here. Um, a lot of angulation. There's a lot of definition with regard to objects, depth, and dimensions. And, you know, so many of those things in Art Deco were very, very prominent where there was nothing but... Uh, so it's interesting to see all of the angles and the, and the different reflections that are caused by the sunlight on the angle. So this is really an interesting mix, even though it, it certainly wouldn't be considered Art Deco by anything. The Cubism or someone else uh, would really be interested in, in this particular movement. So the way the, the angles meet, uh, the, the, the straight angles meet them with the curved, whatever that ribbon or whatever that handle type structure is, really presents an interesting um, foreplay in the front of the front of the main subject matter so uh, it, it's very interesting how you did that and did you did you actually uh, place these objects in that order to to do this or is it just something you happened upon um yeah we placed it uh, the different people put in different um pieces up and then you kind of went around the you know the still life and saw what try to figure out what you know, place you thought would be most interesting and just focus in. Because it's actually, of course, bigger. It was bigger than that. But I zoomed in and kind of focused on that one area mm -hmm. and just drew sure. what was in that area. Now, this is a much larger piece. And not only that, she has not framed this, but matted this with a beautiful white mat. So that makes it even larger. What would you say the size of this piece is? This one is about maybe two by two and a half uh, feet. Maybe even bigger than maybe, maybe bigger than two that. by two and a half by three or three and a half, something like that, huh? Yeah. 
-hmm. But again, with the white mat, very distinctive. So this is something you can take and go ahead and mat it. I mean, that mat it. Go ahead and frame it. Put it on even just a black frame to even add more dimension to it. Or you can take it out of the mat and do what you like with it. But it's just, again, a great piece. And another experiment moving into the, into the graphite. Uh, similar to the other technique of, of the stippling, but uh, using the more traditional methods. All right, now we're going to blow your socks off because we're going to show another. Here she's experimenting in sculpture. And I know everybody uh, knows he's um, one of the most important part of a home today, especially the uh, a lounge area or whatever, the living, not the living room, but the uh, family room is the sculpted chair, the um, reclining chair. Here she's done a, a magnificent chair, uh, and, without, uh, and it's out of cordwood, so it's so striking. Let's, I don't want to give it away. Tell us, uh, as we pan through here, what exactly we have here and, and, and what it was required in putting this together. Um, it's, uh, I would call it a bench more. Cause a it's, bench, okay. It's a Sorry bench. about that. See? Um, and it's made out of corrugated paper, cardboard, and... Um, you just, you know, you do, first you start off by designing it. So, right. And then you kind of, you have to figure out how it would be more stable using cardboard for someone to actually sit on it. And um, so you get the pan, you start cutting out the panels, and then you have to cut out the cross sections, and you have to find a way for them to intertwine so that they would stay and, you know, not move around if someone actually sat on it. And actually from the back, there is a, uh, is a smaller chair because... A what? What's I, on the back? On the back of it, it's a, it's actually a chair, a child's chair. Oh, we, to it. Of course, I'm sorry, we've got nieces. it turned incorrectly, so you can't see both. Yeah, so there's yeah. another chair attached to it. It's it's the same shape, but it's just smaller because I have nieces, and I, when I was thinking about the design, I was like, it would be cool to have a chair where an adult could sit, and then in the back they would have a little child to sit. So the mother and the child could yeah. sit together. Even though the child would be, you know, face if it, it was inside, because um, yeah, you couldn't do outside, this outside. Child be running away, the mom would never know, huh? <laughs> yeah. What a, what an intriguing thing. Now, did you see any chair with this shape, or you came up with the whole concept? I came up with the shape. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Because, you, you know, you have to think about gravity. Like if someone, if it was a different shape, or and it was two sided, if a little kid sat on one side, no one right. on the other then side, then it would, uh, it would top, top over, over. exactly, so or collapse. I had to kind of make it diagonal and still make it. I wanted it to be simple. But no one's actually ever sat on this. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. So it can just, I mean, not certainly mine. I would crush it, <laughs> smash it to pieces because um, of this bulk. But at the same time, you've had no, someone. Actually, um, the test was uh, there's a teacher who was he's a very tall guy and he's thick and he's had to sit on it and it held him up so it's really the way it's the way it's built it does have function yeah so how did you how did you know because I mean, that requires let's see that stuff that's way beyond me the physics of knowing how strong an item would be to ha well, handle we started way. off with um, <clears throat> a model we used just got boxes regular boxes mm -hmm. and we cut it out and we had to make sure that it the, the model was stable and once we got the model the stable, then if you just do the same thing on a larger scale, it should still be stable, and it was. Well, I think it's just amazing. I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's so contemporary, so advanced. And uh, again, what, you know, I see so many things out of different things that, like I say, the artist does, and then that's not right at all. But uh, right now, coming up with Mardi Gras and good friends of mine on Muses Parade, who does shoes? You know, uh, these ladies uh, have the luxury, uh, not the luxury, the generosity of taking someone's commercially used shoe or um, bought and redefining them to the theme of their parade or whatever and giving them they're the, like the new the female token to the uh, coconut of Zulu parade it's so worship I have, I'm fortunate to have a fairly good collection and I'm anticipating next week's uh, re, uh, new addition to that collection and I have to admit the first time I saw it even though you had told me chair mm -hmm. I saw side by side pairs of ladies shoes <laughs> uh, just with the curved, curved the high back so uh, to me, this really looked uh, like a pair of shoes sitting together. Although you do tie them together with that with the crossbars, I just thought it could be an excellent piece in that regard. So, so folks, you see, you you can see so many things in this, but what a great piece to add if you want some depth in your home or your office to uh, have something whimsical 
and let alone run that again. I would, something like this, he certainly wouldn't want it to be used every day for um, someone to sit on because there's a natural wear and tear on the, on the fabric. The fiber is not going to hold up forever if it's used every day. But what an interesting conversation piece. Just a figure point for anything in your uh, in your collection or to start a collection. Uh, now, if I understand correctly, this was on exhibit at, at Xavier. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and you were, you had to retrieve it to bring it to us. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, great, great. Where did you all have this, and what part of the? Uh, Xavier has a gallery, a small ga art gallery in um, the front of the library, Xavier Library. In front of the library, so, and this, well, this one has been great out there, and so it had, a, it had a great visual space for it to show up, huh? Good. Did you ever at any point think of doing it in color other than the natural? Um, yeah, we did, but there wasn't time. Wasn't well, time. Really. Well, it's okay. But I mean, there's nothing wrong with the natural. I mean, just, especially in the days where everybody's looking for the go green and stay natural. So here's a, see, folks, you can recycle anything. Here's a great recycling thing where you've taken cardboard boxes that we throw away after we move, etc. You can, and our true artists can see art out of anything. So, and here's one where. You've done a magnificent job of taking... Uh, That's not actually cardboard box. The model was cardboard box. That is, um, if you go to, um, I believe it's at NOLA Box, it's a store that sells boxing material. And but it is boxing material. Yes, yeah. Well, that's just say, even if... But I'm just trying to... I was drawing an example that... Uh, that not that you had to do it, but showing how the artist can see art in anything. Yeah. So even in a cardboard box or material, that they can create something of of interest and uh, conversational quality and, and just dynamics. So, so it really is, it is a pleasure to see this. All right, now we've got two more pieces. Don't forget, folks, you can call in yet. If you want to speak to Teresa, there are those numbers. Uh, we've got two more to finalize the show, and we want to get through those. Now we're going back to the to the painting mode, and let's see if we can take a look at our next piece. And uh, Teresa, tell us about this piece, please. This one is on masonite. It's um, about three feet by two feet. Okay. Um, it's acrylic paint, and I kind of took the. It was. What's the subject matter? Is there a subject matter no, here, or is it's it's a non-objective uh, painting? Non-objective. Okay. It's I guess you call it abstract, but it's sort of like abstract. Yeah. Okay. But really, what I was trying to capture in this was just motion and doing using different textures, and just different, you know, just kind of experimenting with just mm -hmm. textures and motion. Okay. And now this is acrylic. Yeah. Okay. Now, if I can see correctly, I didn't get a chance to look at this close before the show started. You started with like a black background. Is that what it is? you painted black or no? No. We what is I the background? Started, um, the background was just white, and I just painted the whole thing. Right. But right now, like the areas are between the blue and the yellow, is that, that's not black? That, what color is that? Between the blue and... Right there, in between, which, which I thought was background. No. The whole thing is painted. There's no background. There's this. There's um. Well, oh, these aren't three sections. individual pieces. They're all on one board. Yeah, they're all on one board. So what I'm saying. And it's just different sections. Like okay, each but what section are the, has the, different. The, what textures. colors are the sections between the three vibrant, the red, blue, and yellow? What 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 do we? What color is that? It's kind of blue green. Blue green. Okay. Oh wow. Well, I guess I'm monitoring my eyes really are uh, <laughs> really bad. Okay, but look, look, and so there's nothing you could tell us that actually inspired you per se, other than movement. You said usually when I do like um, try to do abstract, I don't really. I just try to whatever comes out, I put on the board. But so here, and as we, I go, I kind of get inspiration and think about different things and different textures. Okay. Now, what's interesting is this the one that, uh, which is I had to ask because I was curious where the piece actually has a cutout at the bottom, almost yeah. like an artist's palette. There's like a, a semicircular uh, cut, so it no longer is, so it's not a straight. Did you do that, or was yeah, that the piece? if you p uh, pan out, it's kind of an arrow. It kind of looks like... Kind of what? It kind of looks like an arrow if you pan completely out, the way it's just curved at the top. Okay. And it kind of just showing you this is, even with just the outside of the... The uh, board just motion and okay. Well, I can see the curves because the 
the curves of each of the vibrant figures have some different, or some are more linear, but still yeah. curves, especially the red one, right above where it is. Yeah. There's definitely a curved side. But I just thought it was fascinating. I thought maybe you had found this piece already in that condition and really enhanced it. Oh, okay. okay, so there's a, a, a non-objective or an abstract with, again, some vibrant colors, even though I don't see the same colors that <laughs> the artist sees. I think it would be extremely nice, uh, you know, in your home. Now, we have one more before we finish today. And let's go ahead and uh, take a look at that, and then we'll uh, tell everybody about it, okay? It's our last piece, and what do we have here? This one looks awfully dark from my perspective, but I yeah, know that's it, not the case. It is. So part of it is. Um, this one is the only one I have that kind of has meaning to it. Okay. Um, just, it's... Oh, we're panning back, yeah. so now the color's Wait. coming out. Okay. So for this one, I was just, you know, kind of concerned about, you know, seeing a lot of youth. They just don't, you know, in, in Central City and, you know, mm -hmm. poverty, they just don't have any motivation. They just kind of, you know, sit around and don't do anything. And so I have um, this big clock kind of with fire behind it. So this is really a representation yeah. of the uh, of urban life today yeah. where... Uh, unfortunate folk have uh, just really no uh, despair and really uh, nothing to do and time is passing. So you say you have yeah. a clock to reflect that. Show me where that is. Let's to bring it up there and maybe I'm uh, it's, oh, the giant red with the numbers. Yeah, and, there's number one. Uh, and, and what do you think that's well, of course obviously it's time but anything um, how does that mean into that the, when you, you know, you're sitting down and you, that's all you do every day. You're not really doing anything. Time is flying Just, just flying, p flying around while your life is wasted. Yeah and um, what what I did was I have like if you pull out some more it's kind of like you can you pulling the page over and you see on the second page the way I painted it, it's kind of like you could be reaching for the stars you could be doing you know more things with your life other than just sitting around and waiting for things to right so this is like a dual tableau like yeah. you're saying that the first page or the painting is flipping over so if all the person needed to do was get off of his uh, get off his haunches yeah. and open his eyes and look there is some positivity there's some future there's something beyond the the plight that he's in yeah. and I uh, really use the colors the red and the yellow and the um, those are the only two colors that I use that are really bright because it's kind of like caution, you know, you caught, you tell.